I'm, as said, uh, with the Swedish Police Department of National Operations. Uh, I'm conducting a study funded by the Swedish Heritage Board of an attempt to map the entirety of the Swedish art market for the risk rather the risk of for the risk of conflict antiquities rather than what is known to be conflict antiquities themselves i should also say that in the previous year i was of course with the swedish national council of crime prevention so this is a joint study so i'll be focusing on the element of risk al analysis. And I'm hoping that I could pick up on where Professor Hilgert left off. He, he said very poignantly that we need a method we can export to the entirety of Europe, perhaps the entirety of the West, to use to map the market for these types of antiquities not only possibly in the future of conflict antiquities, but this is where we start, and this is where I've started. And the risk analysis element was invented when I realized the impossibility of this question. To what extent are conflict antiquities present in the art market of our country? In order to map an entire art market and look for individual objects, you need to also look for the provenance of each of these individual objects. This is, of course, in 80% of the cases, not possible as the sellers are very rarely cooperative and in in larger part it wouldn't be particularly time efficient I, I would assume such a study <sighs> looking into what is of course a small art market but it still be around a thousand objects possibly looking into the provenance of them and the ownership history, which can be quite time consuming, would be about a decade. And my field study only started in January. So I came up instead with answering question B. Is there a market oops, for these types of objects in our country? And this is where the risk analysis comes in. If we, can, if, we, if we can find these types of objects being archaeologically looted and smuggled out in the art market of a nation, we can therefore assume there is a market for these objects. Hence the risk. And the risk assessment is an old criminal logical theory. Uh, we can only give an estimate of this extent, of course. Uh, as far as mapping the entire objects for sale in auctions, objects for sale on the internet, objects for sale at antique stores who keep catalogues or publish uh, what they're offering online. We can map that. Uh, we can also go into individual antique stores and get a momentary glance, no more. So, but with the catalogue market, we can come up with a quantified probability of how large a market for the conflict antiquities 
types of objects is. And if we can quantify this specifically enough, I'll come into that later, we can use the data we come up with as a tool. We can we will, of course, publish this. Uh, our national security police are interested. Our customs office is very interested. And we can, on the basis of the data, come up with a program of preventative measures. Legislative, uh, preventative in a wider sense, uh, such as involving customs officers, such as uh, enforcing new routines with authorities, or information-based. I think a lot of the speakers previously touched upon the importance of information campaigns to the public, to the purchasers within the art market. So, I'm going to tip that over. If I don't. So this is a rather pragmatic study. We <coughs> I started by asking the questions, what data do we need? We need the data that's specific enough to be used as a tool by the authorities. Where are the objects? And I'll go into the market or market types uh, shortly after this. What object types are most prevalent or more prevalent? And more importantly, I think, and something that possibly the media, I'm sure, will use as a headline uh, if they cover uh, the publication of this report, is an estimated financial volume of the objects. Hence the <laughs> pragmatic element. I then asked what export data is available. We can't, of course, know what quantities of cultural objects are exported from the conflict zones. I think we've had attempts at uh, estimates and explanations of the futility of uh, attempting <laughs> to count uh, the quantities. We do know, however, to uh, quite a certain degree what types of cultural objects there are exported from conflict zones. We have the ICOM red lists, for instance, uh, which is, have been very helpful in the study. And then we, of course, needed to ask what import data was available. In Sweden, there is no data concerning the size, uh, financial size, of the antiques or the antiquities market as a whole. There is no data concerning the size of import of antiquities or antiques. Apart from Sweden is an EU nation, we have a rough estimate of the import of art and antiques from third countries, from countries outside of the European Union. But anything that's passed through Europe or a European or European Union country previously uh, doesn't need to be um, have a declaration, uh, any, any package doesn't need to have a declaration of its contents. We do, however, of course, have the third country imports of antiques and art. Uh, that is one category uh, and the only one you need to declare. And for I think we have if we convert it into euros, um, 
around 60,000 euros per year, but that was from third countries and it was, it was openly declared as arts, antiques or antiquities. And I do have a hunch that's not a fair <laughs> estimate. Uh, I, I, I do believe people fiddle with uh, declaring the contents of packages. So the last one, what, which import data is available, the last one should be within a very large parenthesis. And what market data is available? Again, what market data is available in Sweden? We don't have a detailed provenance of individual objects. We don't have a duty of the seller, of course, uh, legally or morally, to supply one. But we have pictures and descriptions of the catalogued objects. Uh, as I said, the catalogues are from the auction houses, from the irregular market, that is to say, the internet, uh, the Swedish equivalent of eBay. We have pictures and descriptions from sellers of objects on display in galleries and antique shops. And we can also make a fair assumption of object occurrence in the market from past catalogues. I realized fairly soon on that creating an image mapping the Swedish market for Middle East and North African, as they are in general, antiquities in the market in 2017, wouldn't really say a lot if we didn't know what the Swedish market had to offer in these categories before the conflict had started. So we'll have a uh, two decade uh, mapping, two spaced out decade mappings from 1997, uh, which is before the conflict-related looting in Afghanistan mostly had begun, and 2007, uh, which is before the conflict-related looting mainly in Syria and Iraq had started. So that might be, that might give us a clue. If we find a great deal of objects in 2017 and see that the number of the numbers of objects in 1997 or 2007 were a great deal smaller that might be an indication that the conflicts have escalated the import to sweden oh I, I, i've got a picture <laughs> uh you can't see anything on it but uh I think I just threw this in for, for, for colour and entertainment. I was at the largest antiques fair in Sweden uh, in February and found quite openly by the little sign as uh, arrowheads a couple of thousand years old from Afghanistan and India. So. I was quite surprised, and I must admit to say I was quite happily surprised to find something so early on, which with such a clear mark uh, of country of origin. But there are some problems, of course. I think I touched upon this earlier. Um, the blanket coverage of our market of course, we can only do when we are researching catalogued markets, uh, as well as the snapshot we get from antique stores. And mainly, of course, the last point, we have 
description from the seller of an object will not always be truthful, or I should say it will not always be accurate. It may be a seller providing either dishonest information or information they themselves have got wrong. So this will be a margin of error in registering objects. I should see if I can... No. I was very happy to have moved that glass of water. Um, we have developed a, a group of experts, mainly from museums in Sweden. Uh, they each have uh, their own either geographical region or object uh, expert knowledge. And we'll select two months from this study, January because it's the first and June because it's the middle one for symmetry. Um, and we'll try to check whether we've got the description right. I'm not an archaeologist. Um, I'll register the objects as they're described by the seller. If something is described as being from Afghanistan, that's how I'll register it. And I think if we have these two reference months, uh, we can at least get a picture of the accuracy of the study as a whole. And there's a quantitative element, of course. There's a picture in color. Um, we have one first reference catalogue, I should say, uh, of the countries selected for this study. It's countries where we feel, or I feel, uh, there's been probable indications of the loot, the archaeological looting, providing funding, financial funding for a continued conflict. And the red square is uh, the second catalogue, uh, which is a blanket coverage list of all art dealers in Sweden. I was able to do that because all sellers of used objects in Sweden have to register with the police. Um, and as you can see, the I'm not quite sure what the uh, how, how what the English word is for <laughs> the numbers I've chosen, but you can see that six one two is the police region of Dalarna. Uh, Six one would be generalist auction houses, and then this list of the generalist auction houses in Dalarna, and there is of course the uh, list of the specialist auction houses in Dalarna, and the specialist antique stores, and the generalist antique stores, and the irregular market in Dalarna. We won't find anything in. Dalan, I, uh, I think we, we use that part of the country for skiing. But I if we go on to the third catalogue, uh, there's a similar number of systems, uh, similar system of numbers, uh, 2.1.4.3.2, that is a Syrian ring. This is, of course, just types of objects. So these are uh, Syrian objects, which the two marks, uh, Syrian objects made of metal is the one, Syrian objects made of gold, subcategory of metal is four, etc., etc. This is an for the Islamic period gold jewelry of Syria. And there is a description for each of these, uh, often with pictures. Uh, it's a very, very thick reference catalogue, this one. 
uh, and you can see, and it seems a little bit unnecessary at first sight, but the intent is uh, within a statistical context, matching the, the numbers in the red square, the numbers in the second reference catalogue, to the numbers in the blue square, which is the third reference catalogue. And here's the <laughs> spreadsheet of how that looks. Uh, and with this, I hope we will be able to provide the Swedish authorities and the Swedish public with very, very detailed information about uh, categories of objects found, in what market category these objects were found, what prices, what prices the asking price, and each of these number corresponds, of course, to a saved screenshot or image, so that anyone who wishes to criticize this method <laughs> can, can retrace uh, anything they want and look up what we've seen. And there are several more categories, I should say, to this very wide spreadsheet. But the idea finally, is being able to provide so specific information as we possibly can. Uh, an, an Islamic gold ring found in a generalist auction house in Dalarna. And, of course, we won't find anything in Dalarna, but I believe, as Professor Hilgert said, uh, this hopefully can serve as a model uh, for other countries wishing to see their responsibility, their share of the problem uh, within the context of either conflict antiquities, antiquities looted from uh, other problematic regions where there's been a long history of looting, such as China. Um, and I think and Germany, for instance, I think uh, <laughs> would possibly be more helped by this than Sweden. And I may be uh, working with a few too many details, but I hope what I publish by the end of the year will provide some form of quantitative data of Sweden's part in this problem, or the risk of Sweden's part in the problem. So, thank you. <laughs>